Hello everyone, and welcome in or welcome back to True Crime Mysteries. My name's Megan, and today we're going to be discussing four unsolved cold cases. As always, it's so important to shed new light on these cases. Though there hasn't been much movement on them lately, it's important to keep them in the public eye. You never know who might be holding that one piece of evidence that could close any of these cases. Case number three, Althea Dale Blankenship. It was in 1973 when 23-year-old Althea Dale Blankenship and her four-year-old son Jeffrey moved to Port Townsend, close to the Puget Sound in Washington. Althea had spent her early life in Virginia before moving to Washington with her family. She graduated from Shoreline High School, Washington, in 1967, and two years later, her son Jeffrey was born. Althea had set her sights on creating a better life for the pair. Contemporary news articles do not mention whether Jeffrey's father was in the picture, and it appears he has never been named publicly. After spending a few years in Shoreline, Althea decided to move 50 miles to Port Townsend, Washington. Althea's parents, Oscar and Mary Marks, owned a home in Port Townsend, and she wanted herself and her son to be closer to her parents. The move was a breath of fresh air for the two, and they rented a room from Glenn Allen Bagley. According to local news reports, Althea and Glenn developed a romantic interest in one another. Unfortunately, little is known about Althea's time in Port Townsend. We do know that at the time, Glenn Bagley was separated from his wife, Esther Mae Gessler. Just three years after Althea and Jeffrey were last seen, Esther, too, would disappear. She was last seen in Auburn, Washington on March 13, 1976, leaving home in her Blue Mercury station wagon. By 1976, Esther had remarried and was training to become a paralegal. On the day that Esther disappeared, she told her second husband that she was going to rent a hotel room so she could be alone to study. While the disappearance of Esther and Althea have never been officially connected, it is hard to ignore the striking similarities. Althea and her son Jeffrey were last seen on March 27, 1973, at or close to the apartment that they shared with Glenn Bagley. That day, Althea and Jeffrey were due to travel to the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. From there, they had plans to fly to New York City and catch a connecting flight to Greece to meet up with Althea's parents, who were already holidaying there. Unfortunately, Althea and Jeffrey never made it to their flights and have never been seen or heard from again. Glenn is believed to be the last person to have seen the pair alive. He told the Kent Police Department that on March 27th, he dropped Althea and Jeffrey off at the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport, which was the last time he saw them. Investigators doubted his story, but without solid evidence, they were unable to move forward with a conviction. While searching Althea's room, they uncovered letters between the two that exposed their romantic relationship, which had previously been unknown. Following the 1976 disappearance of Esther, authorities ramped up their investigation of him. Glenn soon caught wind of the police attention that he'd garnered and had moved to the Philippines to escape the heat. Glenn Allen Bagley never returned to the United States, passing away in 2016 from cancer. According to the Charlie Project, the Kent Police Department tried to build a case against him for many years, but were always unsuccessful. An ex-girlfriend at Bagley later told investigators that he had not been building a cat house on the day of Esther's disappearance, as he had told law enforcement. She refused to tell the police anything else, as Glenn had threatened her, telling her, quote, You will end up in the same culvert in Kinsine as Esther. Searches for Althea, Jeffrey, and Esther have been conducted, but nothing has been found so far. In 1973, burned and charred human remains were discovered on Protection Island, just off of Discovery Bay. Unfortunately, the chain of custody is somewhat murky on these remains, with the Port Townsend leader reporting, quote, The remains pulled from the island burn pile in 1973 were transferred to the University of Washington's Anthropology Lab. It was concluded that the University of Washington had no documentation of those remains, nor several other associated records from that era. 
Althea Dale Blankenship is described as a Caucasian female with brown hair, blue eyes, 5'7", and 135 to 140 pounds. Jeffrey Dean Blankenship was described as a white male with brown hair, brown eyes, 3'5", and 75 pounds. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective John Thompson of the Kent Police Department at 253-856-5800, quoting case number 76 dash 705. Case number two, Patricia Eve Gogler. It was on September 29, 1980, approximately five miles from Ashland, Virginia, at around 6.30 p.m. when firefighters were attempting to put out a brush fire when they came across the burned remains of a young woman. She was found on a gravel dirt road that would be later named Wesley's Court, just off of what is now Greenwood Church Road, approximately 12 minutes outside of Ashland. The woman was able to be identified quickly through dental records. She was Patricia Eve Gagler. Not much is known about the young woman, but she was 28 years old. She was moving from her hometown in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, to live with her brother in Richmond, Virginia. Authorities would discover that she had last been seen on September 29th around 3 p.m. at a Sunoco gas station in Ashland, Virginia. News reports from 1980 stated that she'd been there to get a used car tire. They would also discover her vehicle on the dirt road near the fire. An autopsy was performed and the medical examiner stated that Patricia had died from an upper airway's burns due to immolation or death by fire. They said that she had most likely died within seconds of her airways being burned. They also stated that they didn't find any other wounds on her body, as well as no evidence of sexual assault. They could not determine if she had been conscious at the time of her death, and her death was ultimately ruled a homicide. There has been no speculation if the killer had started the fire, or it had already been started and just utilized. No suspect has ever been reported to the public. There is no record that Patricia had been married at any point in her life. Her last known occupation had been stated as a waitress on her death certificate. Both of her parents passed away in 2010 and 2012, and they never got to know what happened to their daughter. Patricia was last seen at that gas station, and she'd only been about 30 minutes from Richmond, Virginia. Law enforcement has always been stumped on why she'd been on that road going in the wrong direction when she was last seen on the main road to Richmond. Authorities have never released much about this case, and details for this are significantly lacking. In January 2022, deputies from the Hanover County Sheriff's Department asked the public to come forward with any information regarding the case of Patricia Eve Gagler. The Hanover Sheriff's Office has asked that if you have any information regarding the crime, you're asked to contact Crime Stoppers at 804 365 6396 or contact Investigator Robertson with the Hanover County Sheriff's Office at 804-365-6396. Case number one, Sheila Sue Connor. 30-year-old Sheila Sue Connor was described as a loving and caring mother to her 8-year-old son, David. Sheila's life hadn't always been easy, with her son telling local news outlets that she'd been subjected to violence from a young age. Despite her challenging beginnings, Sheila was a kind and gentle soul who ensured her son would never have to face the same hardships she did. The two lived together in Houston, Texas, and things were going well for a while. That was until December 31, 1991. David's only memory of that day was being pulled out of the bath and being told to dry off and put on some clothes as quickly as possible. Houston police officers crouched to his level and told him the devastating news. His beloved mother was missing. At eight years old, this was hard for David to comprehend, and it took several years for him to be able to process that day entirely. According to reports, Sheila was last seen at Echo Glen Lane at the home of her boyfriend. The man with whom Sheila was in a relationship was much older than her, and her friends and family worried for her safety. Sheila was considerably more vulnerable as she was battling with addiction at the time of her disappearance. That she's somebody who was subjected to violence from a very young age, um, and so that led to a certain lifestyle that ended up um, putting her in a position to where, you know, she was under threat by somebody who was violent. 
The last known contact from Sheila Connor came at 3.30 a.m. when she called a friend from her boyfriend's home in North Houston. She told a friend that she and him had gotten into an argument, and that was the last time anyone ever heard from Sheila. She was reported missing days later. When her missing person investigation began, her car was found abandoned and stripped down along Interstate 45 in New Haven, Texas. Sheila's boyfriend has never been publicly named, but David Connor believes his mother was murdered that night. David now works with the media to ensure his mother's name and story has never been forgotten. Sheila Sue Connor is described as a white female with brown hair, brown eyes, 5 foot, and 130 pounds. She has a scar on the right side of her chin and the following tattoos, a leaf on her left leg, a rose on her right breast, and a tattoo on her arm. She was last seen wearing a black jacket, blue jeans, and may be wearing glasses. Her son is still hopeful that someone with information will come forward and he can finally have some answers. Oh, I want her life to be remembered uh, as a woman who deserved dignity. Uh, I think she deserves dignity for her story. I think her story should be told. Anyone with information is asked to contact Denise O'Leary of the Harris County Sheriff's Office at 712-221-6000. Quoting case number HC08008-1890. Well, that's going to be it for this video. What are your thoughts? Which cases do you think will be solved soon? And what do you think will be the key piece of evidence to close these cases? For more cases like this, click here for our cold case. And if you see anything you want me to cover next, let me know. But that's it for me. Thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. I'll see you all in the next video. Stay safe out there. Goodbye.